and just follow our usual format and the speaker can uh, moderate our own questions. How much inequality can democracy take? That's a, that's a long-standing question, right? <laughs> do, um, I don't know. Do you, do you have uh, thoughts on that? I, I mean, it, it's definitely a problem for democracy, right, if we, if we reach extremes, which we can debate about what's, what's the definition of, of when we have the, the, the point at which we can't handle any more in, inequality. I don't, I don't know. So I've been asked to repeat the question so that other people can hear it. So that, that was a lot, so I'll try to recap it, and I, and I apologize for not doing full justice. Um, so the comment was that, uh, there, that this gentleman has seen research that shows that both the Republican and the Democratic parties have not been uh, accurately representing their constituents, that they've been paying more attention to the top 1%. Uh, what implications does this have going forward for the parties and for representation in, in American democracy? Um, and I think that that sentiment is exactly what we're seeing in terms of public reactions and trust levels in government is that, that people aren't feeling represented regardless of, of the party that they're identifying with. This is, this is widespread sentiment that people are feeling forgotten uh, by those in, in Washington and those in power. Um, and I think that, again, I think that that's why, and someone was asking me, how could these people have voted for Trump? I'm still doing a bit of head scratching but for some people, they saw him as being outside of this partisan environment that we call Washington. And for some people, they liked that, right? That they thought that Trump was, was not a partisan and that they didn't care about that. They, they wanted someone that was going to represent them and be their voice. Um, and you saw that in Trump's inauguration speech where he talks about we're returning power to the people. Um, yeah. Uh, I had a question about your statistics earlier and and the uh, Supreme Court yes. decision. Yes. Could that not be <clears throat> also exchanged by uh, the Supreme Court versus Roe versus Wade being overturned and making that into the one political issue that many of the voters had, which is on abortion? Oh, so could people have been concerned about the issue of abortion and that was what was playing into why that they were so concerned Correct. about the Supreme Court? Absolutely. So we know that there are some people that are single issue voters or some people that abortion is a key issue in determining uh, their vote choice. And absolutely, I think that those, those types of voters were thinking about the balance of power in the Supreme Court and the potential. And you saw this with Trump on the campaign trail, that he brought this up as an issue. He was asked about how... How are you going to decide? Are you going to have a litmus test for your Supreme Court nominees? Are they going to need to be pro-life nominees? So I definitely think that, that people were thinking about that when they were thinking about how important the Supreme Court nominees were. Um, I don't think it was the case that for everyone that's what that they were thinking about with respect to the court. Um, but for some people, I do think that that indirectly played, in, played into why this is such a pressing concern for them. Yeah, there's, that's, that's why I said that I think there's a large number of issues that people could have been thinking about when they're thinking about, I care about who gets appointed to the court. I think for conservative voters and for, for pro-life voters, they probably had that in mind. But people had a large number of issues that the Supreme Court plays a pretty bit, big role in our democracy that they had in their minds. Uh, I'd like to go back to the first question a little bit further in that... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, related to the first question, I should say, a question about, you mentioned the pendulum, you mentioned uh, 
dissatisfaction with government, uh, and uh, the, uh, I'd like you comment on, in, in spite of all that, how does the House and Senate maintain their majority <laughs> when they are the government that the people are dissatisfied with? Right. So th again, like I said, I think this is a complex story in trying to explain this election. Um, so I think that, that when we're thinking about those pendulum swings, that what most people are thinking about is the presidency as being like the, the chief executive and caring about not having that, 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 that much power resting in one party's hands for too long. Um, in terms of explaining what happened in the House and the Senate, that was another one that surprised me, and I was, I was buying into all of the predictions and the polls that were showing that we were not only going to see Hillary Clinton winning the, the uh, presidential election, but we were going to see big, big seat gains for the Democrats in the House and, and the Senate. Uh, so how do we explain that? Um, I think, again, it goes back to this shift in policy mood in the country that uh, people kind of ignored. That since so, and this this relates to people's policy preferences. That you tend to want more government involvement, and then you want a little less because you've had too much. Uh, so I think that we saw saw voters uh, that wanted less government involvement. We saw the shift in conservative policy preferences, and I think that got translated not only to the presidential vote, but also to the House and the Senate vote. And. I, I would also be curious to see research to see what sort of coattail effects that Trump might have had on support for Republican candidates. <laughs> yes. I think you're over to me on the far right. Look, wrong right. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My so, right. <laughs> this, this, is, this is the third discussion we've had, and so far all three of you have acted as though the shift in public attitudes is sort of an independent thing. And I would not believe that. I think that there's a, a lot of PR into changing public attitudes against disliking the American government. I think the Heartland Institution, the Platt Institute, there's lots of money being put into saying your government doesn't work for you. And that's been true since Reagan was saying years ago, government is the problem. And so would you talk about that? Because I think it really colors your presentation. OK, so, um, so I haven't really yet talked about what are the causes of this discontent, or what are the causes of these lowering levels of trust level that we've seen in the past few decades. Um, and I think that there's not one single answer. So I think the, the factors that you raise definitely could be contributing factors. Um, I think that um, it's not a, a single cause explanation, but rather it's a multiplicity of causes that have been occurring that have been leading to these lower trust levels that we've seen. Um, I think part of it is the media environment. Uh, we know that there's negativity bias when it comes to the media, that they love to focus on, on the negative, on the political scandals. And this compounded with the 24-hour news cycle in that they're constantly harping on these things. Uh, and also the fragmentation of the media that people are now, it's easier for you to tune into the media outlets and the type of information that you want to obtain. Um, that this all feeds into that growing discontent. And I think that that's part of the explanation for why we're seeing such sharp divides in terms of how that people are feeling about the other political side. So I think the media is part of it. Um, I think there's a number of reasons that we probably don't have time to go into all of them. Government itself is part of it. Uh, there's research showing that uh, incivility in Congress is on the rise. So if the media love to cover negativity and Congress is giving them more uh, fodder to, to cover, uh, these all lead to a vicious cycle of, of this incivility that we're seeing not only in Congress, but among how that we're treating each other and thinking about members of the other party. And so I do think that this is a vicious cycle that doesn't have a single explanation, um, that it's, it's a number of contributing factors that we've seen over recent decades. I would agree with that. I think that was Barry over there. <laughs> I, I think the 30 years of beating the right wing drum has had to have a huge effect, especially when you see their language adopted in the media so easily and glibly, and it just becomes the common way to think about it. A good example is Obamacare. 
You don't call it the Affordable Care Act. You call it Obamacare and you try to spend that. So, uh, which I think backfired a little bit because there are a lot of people like me who would be dead without the Affordable Care Act. And I don't think they voted Trump. Not many anyway, although <laughs> you never know. Um, but that raises uh, another question of a, a couple, a, a cluster, as you say, a lot of the different influences. Uh, first of a, a question, is education levels, when you're looking at who voted, is that a proxy for a little higher income and a um, little more job security? That they're not as desperate as the people who are willing to throw Trump at the Washington establishment? And in terms of you know, the very narrow focus we've got here on, on income inequality, I think you can look at the income gap, but if you know Hillary Clinton has served time um, in, in service on the board of directors of Walmart, and she's the one who's going for $12 minimum wage instead of 15, I think that implies a certain class divide, that there are a lot of people who are getting, um, getting tired of the Clintons, uh, not just the two immediate Clintons, mind you, but, but that, that whole approach, especially in the, in the Democratic Party, because it just seems to stink. Okay, so a lot there. Let me, let me do my best to tackle that. Um, so I, I do want to address your, your point, your first point about rhetoric. Um, I do think that that's, that is a big contributor to these uh, rising or uh, increasing distrust and partisan animosity. Uh, this is one of the things that I study with several of my colleagues is we're calling it political vilification. That the way that politicians are talking about each other and talking about their policies, it's no longer just I disagree with the respectable senator from the great state of whatever, or, for, or I disagree with this Republican or this Democrat, um, or I disagree with these policies. The rhetoric has shifted to uh, vilifying the other party and talking about how that these policies are a danger to American democracy, that these are evil uh, propositions. And so I think that when you have that type of shift in rhetoric, um, that that really does uh, contribute to the public's rising distress levels. Um, with respect to uh, how are education levels uh, mattering in this election, so yes, they tend to be correlated with all of the other predictors of Trump's support, um, things like income levels. Um, and so I do think that there's some confounding factors there in terms of which one was the main driver. Um, we, we do know that they all mattered, so Trump did better in, in lower education. Uh, areas he did better in areas with lower income and these two things do tend to go together so I think that gets a little bit complicated in terms of uh, disentangling um, and with respect to the Clinton fatigue so I do think that that was a factor in this election I think it was a factor that, that the Hillary Clinton campaign underestimated uh, and again I, I will bring back up the the figure in terms of people didn't like their choices in this election. Um, this wasn't just that uh, people didn't like Trump. They didn't like Hillary Clinton either. Uh, and I know that for some Clinton supporters, that's a tough t pill to swallow uh, when you think about contrast effects. Well, how could you have voted for that guy? Uh, well, people didn't really like Hillary Clinton that much either. Uh, and this was, on, this was, this was broadly. Um, so again, I think that, that, that there's additional research that needs to be done to look at how that how that these uh, unfavorability ratings for both of these candidates, and particularly on the Clinton side, how that that affected turnout levels, um, because that could be a critical piece to understanding how that she lost the Electoral College vote in, in, in the election. I have a question about the last week or two of the campaign, the letters, FBI. Do you have any data that would suggest that that may have swung that many votes in those three or three or four? Uh, battleground states? So I don't know specific, specifically with respect to state level data, um, but I do know that public opinion polls following the FBI release of additional information about Hillary's emails that you did start to, sh and it gets kind of hard to disentangle that but from the other campaign dynamics that were going on. So this is all going on as we're approaching election day. Uh, but you did see when you looked at the broader public opinion trends in terms of Trump's support and Hillary's support, uh, you started to see a, a convergence 
that again, people were just given how overwhelmingly people were predicting that this was going to be a Hillary Clinton win, people, I think, kind of ignored those trends and said, and kind of when we look at like uh, Nate Silver's adjustment from 99 to 71%, well, yeah, there's some changing uh, patterns in public opinion, but she's still going to win. So I do think that it mattered, and I think that we see that in terms of the public opinion data. Um, but in terms of being able to, to tease it out and specifically attribute it to that event, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to do that. Is there? I'm fine. How many people in Nebraska did not vote for either presidential candidate? I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I have heard talk about that, that that there were a large, all I've heard is sort of general conversation, so I don't, unfortunately, I don't have any specific uh, statistics that I can give you on that. Um, I did hear from numerous people and numerous conversations that uh, people didn't like their choices, and so they didn't vote for either candidate. So again, I think that that's something else that we need to look at and try to, to understand this, these election results, is um, what percentage of people uh, voted for someone else on the presidential ticket. So I know that some people were uh, voting kind of party lines when it came to the House and the Senate, but when it got to the presidential vote, they did a write-in or they picked one of the third party candidates. Or they didn't vote at all. Or they didn't vote, yeah. Before the break, someone asked you about gender. Yes. Do you have anything that you could share on that, on how that broke in this election? Sure, so one of the uh, aspects of this election that got a lot of attention was the, was the uh, the women's vote in this election. Uh, I can't remember the exact statistic. I've got it on some other slides that I have, but I think that it was 53% of women voted for Donald Trump. And then when you looked at how that this uh, was with white women, the percentage was even higher. Uh, so I got asked by some media outlets in terms of how, how can you explain this? Uh, how could women have voted for Donald Trump in this election? Um, and as much as I hate to cite Kelly Conley, uh, in terms of her explanation for this, I do think that what she said uh, makes sense in this election is that she said people are voting uh, by what affects them, not by what offends them. And I think that partisan ties when it comes to the women's vote in this election were really underestimated. Uh, so some people were talking about, you know, given the misogynistic language that emerges on the campaign trail with respect to Donald Trump, how could any uh, woman with a pulse have voted for him in this election? Well. Women have different policy issues that concern them. And for some women, this was a matter of, do I vote for the Republican or do I vote for the Democrat? Um, and so I think that partisan ties when it came to, the, to how women voted in this election were, were really underestimated. Would you comment on uh, your viewpoint that Bernie Sanders would have won the Democratic yeah. primary? What so, difference, if yeah. any, in your crystal ball would you <laughs> Well, as I, so the, the question was, would I comment on what, what would have been the political reality if Bernie Sanders had won the Democratic nomination, and if I could look into my crystal ball. Um, there's actually a political scientist, Larry Sabato, who he's known for his crystal ball in predicting uh, elections. Uh, but as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, you should not be trusting any sort of crystal ball, or, or the magic eight ball might be more realistic in terms of my predictions. They're really not that great. Um, I do think that it would have been interesting to see if, if Bernie Sanders had, had won this election. Uh, if we think back to the slide that I showed you in terms of uh, the key counties in Michigan and Wisconsin uh, that Hillary lost, and she lost those key swing states, those were states that Bernie Sanders won the primaries. She should have known that she needed to pay more attention to these states. And yet, one of the criticisms uh, of the Clinton campaign was that she didn't spend a lot of time in these states. She thought they were in the bag. Um, so what would have happened if Bernie Sanders had, had, won, had won the Democratic primary? I don't know, someone earlier brought up the comment of he was quite narrow in terms of his uh, issue agenda for this election, uh, and that could have hurt him in terms of the general election. At the same time, I'm not sure how that those dynamics would have played out because Bernie Sanders really did a great job at mobilizing elements of the Democratic Party that just weren't excited by Hillary Clinton. So I think going back to the Clinton fatigue, um, 
There were some people that really were excited and mobilized by Bernie. I was just astounded by, so we had, it was really exciting, at least for a political scientist on campus in the fall, that we had lots of the candidates and their campaigns visiting. Um, and I was able to encourage my students to attend their events. And I try to be really nonpartisan and promote uh, all types of events. Um, and yet it was really striking to see the difference in attendance at when Bill Clinton came to Lincoln versus when Bernie Sanders came to Lincoln. So I tried to go to both events, but couldn't get into Bernie Sanders' event <laughs> because I had class before, and so I couldn't stand on the sidewalk for two and a half hours before the event. Um, so there was something about the Bernie Sanders campaign that was really engaging uh, portions of the Democratic Party that just weren't excited about Hillary Clinton. I was just struck by how cool this old dude was among the college campus voters. Um, so I think it would have been interesting to see what, what would have happened if Bernie had been the, been the candidate. Um, again, if I had to guess, I would think that he might have been more successful. But again, I, as I said, I'm not that good at making predictions. Well, there's, there's been a lot of, a lot of talk about uh, resentment of government. But one thing that I, th I think has been missed is hostility to public employees. I mean, public employees have stable jobs, they have good benefits, they generally have reasonable salaries, and they're, they're enriched in urban areas and impoverished in rural areas. And I, I suspect that this has been an important factor. Okay, I, I don't know anything specifically that I could speak to to that, other than I would refer you to Kathy Kramer's book. I think that what you're mentioning kind of goes along with that urban resentment that rural America uh, that she finds that they that they hold. Uh, so that could be part of it. I, I don't know, but thanks for bringing up that point. It would appear that um, that the forgotten Americans uh, were in fact right. We were all so surprised, um, and obviously we weren't paying attention to them. I want to know about slightly uh, behind this general anti-government rhetoric. Um, there have been some strategic shifts that occurred. At Waters, uh, at, the, at the start with the Reagan election, the Southern strategy implemented wedge politics, which have been a driving, a core idea for Republican elections ever since. And the general hostile, broad uh, kinds of issues are in light of that. They also, in the Republican Party, had as the main strategy through the 90s, capturing the state houses. And the 2000 uh, redistricting changed uh, really quite forever uh, the nature of partisan politics in this country. Safe districts almost everywhere mean that the conversations in home districts always play to the extremes of, of the partisan divide. So there's no natural conversation that Congress people have to really entertain in their home district. So why would they go to Washington and have that? What I'd like to know is in light of this, I don't think it's a conspiracy, but do we read then that Donald Trump was just a sort of accident of history at the right moment when this perfect storm of these things came together? Uh, or is there some genius behind it that really saw it? I don't think it was engineered. It, it, it was planned piecewise, but the Republicans had no clue that this was going to happen this way. Okay. So I think your point about bringing up redistricting and how that we're having sort of isolated political conversations uh, by, by members of government, I think that that's also a contributing factor to, this, to these deep-seated divisions that we're seeing, not only in Congress. So we've, we've long known that we've had political polarization in Congress. What's new about recent research is that not only are we seeing this in Congress, but we're seeing this in the mass public. Um, so I, I do think that that's, that's another contributing factor to that. Uh, in response to the question of was this good timing or was this genius, um, I think it's a little bit of both. So I, I, think that, I think that Trump, regardless of if you disagree with what he was saying or his campaign style, I think he was very intentional in his campaign rhetoric. And I think that he was trying to tap into this discontent that he saw and so I think that there's part of that to give him a little bit of credit, although uh, the additional days that he has in office 
part of that, in my mind, keeps getting eroded. Um, but I do think there's a timing issue. Because again, Trump's campaign was surprised by this win. They didn't think he was going to pull this off. So I think that people really underestimated how deep-seated these divides are and how deep-seated this government resentment is across the country. So I think it's a little bit of both. I think that's a great question, though. And you're probably going to get me in trouble because I, uh, because I said both. I had a, had a question. Uh, oh. When you were introduced, you said you had an interest in the psychology of, of why people vote the way they do. Then I have my question concerns, why do people vote against their own self-interest? And the best, the best example I can think of is that Nebraska farmers, and probably throughout the Great Plains, voted for Trump overwhelmingly. Yet he was right up front and said he's going to do away with NAFTA. Yeah. And from an agricultural community, that's a disaster. Yeah. Comment? Great question. Um, so why do people vote against their own economic self-interest? Uh, unfortunately, there's a large amount of political psychology research to answer that question. And the basic, the, the short response is that people do it all the time. And the reason for that is that people oftentimes aren't voting based on the facts. They're voting on their perceptions of reality. And they perceived Donald Trump to be good for their, for their self-interest. Um, even if we looked at, at concrete data that says otherwise, that's not necessarily what mattered in this election or in any election. It's people's perceptions of those facts. Uh, so yes, unfortunately, people frequently, and I think that we definitely saw that in this election. That's, again, part of the head scratching for me in terms of how many Republicans and how many conservatives voted for this guy who, when you looked at his campaign rhetoric, was taking on the Democratic stances on many issues. So if we're thinking about voting based on your on your values or your self-interest, a lot of it didn't make sense with respect to Trump. But again, we see it all the time. Wasn't there a statistic out that over 35% of the Trump voters thought that Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act were two different items? And they were for Affordable Care Act, but they were against Obamacare. So I haven't seen that specific statistic, but I wouldn't even be surprised if it was a larger percentage than that. Um, we know that framing matters. That's one of the things that I study is, is campaign rhetoric and framing. And so when you ask people, do you support the Affordable Care Act, the percentages are much higher than if you ask them if they support Obamacare, right? Uh, so people, uh, it's easier for voters psychologically to form impressions of candidates as opposed to policy impressions. So for most people, they don't know a lot about the policy details. But they know, again, getting back to whether you're voting based on your, your self-interest. They just don't know those details. But it's psychologically easier and cognitively less demanding to know how you feel or whether you trust a politician. And so people, people do that a lot in terms of they know how they feel about Obama. Well, I either like or dislike that, so I like or dislike Obamacare. Affordable Care Act, that sounds reasonable. Sure, I support it. Yeah. Yes. And then. I'd like to go. Take us back to the topic for this series of income inequality. Let me argue that your measurement is being with your menu board of what influenced people's choices, health care, education, foreign policy, immigration, whatever, many of those other topics are deeply affected by income inequality. So when somebody mentions health care, the problem is poor people are not getting health care, not the top 1%. When you go, you could say the same thing for education. If what happened in Flint, Michigan, happened in Gross Point, Michigan, it would have been fixed by now. And so I think income inequality is a much bigger problem than your data is telling us at this point. So I think, it's, I think you bring up some great points. I think it's important that, again, what I'm highlighting here is what was important in the, in the American public's mind. And the connections that you're making are very reasonable, but also very sophisticated connections and a sophisticated understanding 
of economic inequality that I think for most voters, they're just not making those connections. They're not thinking about it in that sense. And also, I think it depended on, again, if you were a Trump versus a Clinton supporter in terms of whether you were going to see all of those issues that you see as being uh, affecting income inequality, whether you considered those as a whole to be important really vary depending on whether you were a Trump or a Clinton supporter. How important they were to you was affected by which candidate you were endorsing. Uh, you show one graph that's, that shows an increase of the perception of one party from the other, like people just don't like the other side anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see this phenomenon uh, occurring globally in other countries? And if so, uh, does it have to do with something like um, more awareness of the inequality, like inequality always existed, but now we are more aware because we have more uh, access to information, to social media and to internet and whatever, and this becomes more evident. So. Okay, um, so again, great question, a lot of different components there. Um, in terms of do we see these, times, these types of partisan splits in other countries, it does get a little bit more complicated when we're talking about other countries that have multi-party systems, right? But I do think that there are some parallels in terms of shifts in public attitudes uh, in the 2016 election that relate to other things that are happening around the world. So when we look at Brexit, right, we can kind of think about that as being people's uh, discontent uh, with, with political insiders. Uh, and wanting to close borders. And I think that we saw some of those dynamics playing into the 2016 election as well. Um, in terms of does economic inequality matter in other parts of the world? So this isn't an area that I know a lot about the research, uh, so I can't give you the best answer. Um, I did see a recent study that was looking at uh, how income inequality across a, a, a large number of countries, I think they were comparing about 25 different countries, uh, they found that income inequality in the country does affect satisfaction with democracy. So uh, it does seem to be linking how that losers and winners in elections, it's not just uh, demographics or whether they felt left out of the system, but also economic inequality, so actual measures of it, do seem to be contributing as well. So people in more unequal countries uh, have more dissatisfaction with democracy than in democracies that have a more equal distribution. If, if I could uh, follow up on the theme of economic inequality, I forget which slide it was, but it seemed to me your data indicated that Trump voters, and I would say Republican voters in general, are not very concerned about economic inequality it mm -hmm. seems to me the data suggests that for these voters, as long as they have a job or their family is moving slightly ahead, that's enough and they don't really resent the 1% or these CEOs that get $10 million every year. They accept that as just capitalism. And of course, a, a certain amount of inequality is built into capitalism. The question is, you know, how much is too much? But for Republican voters in particular, they're not all that concerned with economic inequality. If there's growth, if there's personal satisfaction, then they tolerate a lot of economic inequality. Isn't that what your data shows? Yeah, I, I think that that's a, that's a great uh, understanding of, of, this, of this figure and of the reality in this election. And there's, there's other research to, to back up exactly what you're saying, is that when we look at how that people form their perceptions of economic inequality, that again, they don't do a very good job of incorporating the facts, um, that they're more likely to base those perceptions on how that they are personally doing rather than, they don't have a very good, and I know that this sounds demeaning to the average voter, but again, most people just, don't get into the complexities to think about these things in terms of the, the gap between the rich and the poor. They're caring more about, and that's where also that even though when, when you look at actual economic indicators, and I know that they get really complex in terms of evaluating trends in economic inequality, most of those patterns have shown that in, income inequality has been, has been increasing over the past 30 years. 
And yet when we ask people their perceptions, they don't do a great job of evaluating how well things have changed over time. It tends to be based more on their personal experiences, but also you do also see um, that there's some effects for education that higher educated levels are, are better able to use actual indicators as opposed to their own personal experiences. Um, and I do think that, that this, this figure really highlights it, that Trump supporters really cared about job opportunities for working class Americans. Who were the Trump supporters? Working class Americans. They're caring about those jobs, but the gap between the rich and the poor? I don't care about the gap, I care about how much money I'm bringing home. Can I follow up on that? Uh, you indicated that at some point you're going to start looking at uh, a county level. Why do Trump voting counties have higher amounts of inequality and in the connection between the two? And I'm really curious how you're going to differentiate the two different forms of causality that you're talking about. The one is, I, us as a Trump county have values and put into, in, into effect policies that increase inequality versus there's a lot of inequality and that influences to want to vote for Donald Trump. So your question is how can we disentangle Those two, the direct two effects kinds of causality? The direct effects of income inequality versus how the income inequality may be affecting people personally that then influences their candidate preferences? Is that a fair summary or? Uh, go for it. Okay. <laughs> so, so just to, just to clarify, the research that I was, I was mentioning there is not my own research. This is other, other scholars' research that have looked at this. So this is not something uh, that is directly in my, in my own uh, research agenda. So I would be interested, and I would also have sort of the puzzling questions that I think that you're bringing up in terms of how do, how do we tease this out uh, in terms of understanding how did income inequality lead to greater Trump support? And I think that that's going to be a challenge. Uh, and fortunately for me, it's not my challenge, but it's someone else's challenge. <laughs> yes. And then. Uh, social prestige and loss of privilege. I'm, I'm looking at all the different data that you're putting forth, and I'm asking myself how much, how much of what we're seeing really is the loss, the perceived loss of privilege, the anti-Obama, the fact that people are voting against what it seems to be their own economic interests. When you look at the voter blocks that voted for Trump, they would all be blocks that uh, have a perception of loss of privilege. Mm -hmm. And those hot button items that are the wedge politics are very much oriented around those. Again, very insightful question. I think that that goes back to, again, it's not my own research, so I can't blame credit for it, but Kathy Kramer's work on rural resentment. I think that that's a nice summary of the basic findings that she uh, comes across in these conversations with, with individuals leave, living in rural Wisconsin, uh, that they felt like that they were ignored by the urban elite, that they, that they felt like that they weren't given the respect, and they also felt like that they weren't given their fair share of tax dollars. Uh, so I think that, again, part of that is explaining why that these individuals in these areas voted for Trump. I have a question to the campaign. Uh, how could uh, Hillary have, or Bernie, but uh, how could this campaign have been better uh, planned and strategized in order to meet some of the things you've talked about? Was her campaign uh, not on track? Was this just a big force of, of uh, history at, at work? Do you have any thoughts on that? So I wish I was making the big bucks that I could have been asked that during the campaign. So maybe I could have been hired by, the, by, by Hillary. Um, but I do think there were some missteps in terms of uh, candidate strategy. Um, in terms of campaign rhetoric, I think that she may be kicking herself for not uh, using actually the 92 slogan of it's the economy stupid. Um, that really wasn't the main emphasis of, of her campaign. She had this slogan of I'm with her. Um, what does that mean? Is it that you're voting for the first female candidate? It didn't really capture what most of the American public, and again, this gets tricky, especially since she won the popular vote, right? Um, but um, I do think that 
that part of this economic anxiety that large portions of the country were feeling weren't really addressed by her campaign rhetoric. Um, and in terms of a, a campaign misstep, I do think, and numerous people have commented on this, so I'm not the first to say this, is that I think she underestimated those, those swing states that were upsets. Um, when you looked at the campaign visits, she wasn't visiting those states. Um, and essentially, I think in one of them, the day before the election, she made a visit. So her internal polling probably told her, something's going on, you better go. Uh, but by that point, it was too late. Yes. What if we aren't ready for a, a woman president, and no matter who had run, she wasn't going to elect? So the question was, what if we're not ready for a, a female president, and maybe, maybe it wouldn't have mattered which female was running, that they, they wouldn't have, have won the election. So we don't have that counterfactual to, to look at that. Um, but I do think that, again, Hillary was just a bad candidate. It, it wasn't a matter of being a bad female or you know, it, it wasn't necessarily about gender. Um, I think that there's still concerns about what role did sexism play in this election, and I'm not sure that there's, at least I haven't seen data to support those accusations. Again, I think partisan ties were just underestimated in this election. Republicans tended to vote for the Republican candidate, and Democrats voted for the Democratic candidate. Um, would it have been different if we'd had a more engaging candidate regardless of gender? Maybe. Maybe. I, we don't know yet, right? So I guess we can, we can see in, in four years to see if something different happens. Uh, again, I'm not sure if this was election primarily defined by gender. I think it was more about the, the specific candidates that were running. But. I did look up one thing we talked about, uh, and in Nebraska, uh, turnout was 71%, which is more than I had recalled. So it was, it's good to know the numbers. And one thing that, that also surprises me is that since both of the main candidates were so disliked, why weren't the Libertarians and the Greens able to pick up more of that? Because they were at the usual abysmal levels, as I recall. Well, I was also surprised by turnout levels. Um, so given that these, there was a couple of factors that led me and others to believe that we were going to see depressed turnout in this election overall. Again, I think breaking it down by demographics, we still need to do. Um, but you had disliked candidates. You had rising levels of distrust. Um, you had an election that was really centered on fearful rhetoric in terms of the campaign ads. Um, if we compare this to 2008 and even to 2012, it was a much more optimistic campaign rhetoric, hope and change. Uh, we know that people tend, in terms of political participation, they're more likely to engage in when optimistic things are the focus of, of campaigns. Uh, so there were a number of factors that led me to believe that we were going to see low turnout overall in this election. Uh, and there were actually some reports that were released on election day. I think it was CNN got in a bunch of trouble because they said record low turnout in the past 20 years. Um, they were actually wrong because we did not have all of the turnout data yet. Um, and actually, if you will look at it today, it's actually higher than 2008, overall turnout. And I know that that's, that it surprised me, and uh, it surprised a number of people that, considering the context of this election, weren't expecting a lower turnout. But I do think we need to break it down in terms of demographics. What was the, I think there was a second part of your question. The, the smaller parties. So why didn't, so why didn't the smaller parties do better? Um, again, I think it goes back to our, elect, our electoral system. Uh, that third parties just don't have a shot when we're talking about uh, becoming president in this country. And so for many, I, I, I would like to see how that their vote totals <coughs> compared to maybe previous elections. Like if they were able to garner a, a larger percentage of the vote, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but for many people, even if you didn't like the options, you knew if you wanted your vote to count, um, that you needed to pick the Republican or the Democrat. Well, just a comment to that, which is that, that well, the difference between Trump and, and Clinton was um, three million votes. The right. difference between the, the vote again, the vote that didn't go to either candidate was eleven million. Yeah. Or yeah. no, excuse me, it was eight million. It was yeah. nearly eight million, which which illustrates it's your point about both candidates were disliked. And yeah. And I, I would argue that in the case of the, of the Green and the, and the other parties, is part of their problem was their candidates. 
I mean, they, 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 they were pretty stupid in some of the things they said in the election. So, I mean, and for them, that really would kill them because it killed their credibility. And again, if we would have seen those shifts of those votes for the third party candidates, part of those, were, I mean, I, I don't have enough data to really break it down in terms of how that they would have been divided if they had voted for a Democrat or a Republican. But we know that there's a great likelihood that they would have voted for the Democratic cart party, at least a, 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 a big portion of them. So it could have made the difference in terms of whether Hillary would have won the Electoral College vote. But again, yeah. Yes? In, in thinking about solutions, I was impressed by your data showing the animus that exists between the Republican representatives and the Democratic representatives. And I've had a theory about that. I know in past days, uh, our representatives and their families lived in Washington, and they socialized together, they exercised together, they played together. Now, they come in on Tuesday and they leave on Thursday. To me, it seemed like it's easier to hate an abstract than a person that you socialize with. And I was wondering if you thought the short work week of our representatives has some impact on their ability to come to appropriate solutions. Yes, I, th I think that's a great point. That's one that uh, I've seen several members of com Congress uh, making in interviews in terms of why are we seeing these dynamics, why are we seeing this animosity um, in that they've been pointing out that there's just less interaction between members of the other party uh, in Washington. So I do think that that's probably uh, a contributing uh, factor to this. Uh, but also we have uh, the professionalization of Congress where, where members of Congress are dividing their time between Washington and their districts and so um, those, those pressing priorities that members of Congress have in terms of making sure that they're connecting with constituents, uh, probably a, a lesser priority for them has become uh, interacting and having a sense of community with uh, members of Congress that are on the other side of the political aisle. Some of us observe that most political science and perhaps all economics is very short term. Um, I don't think very many cultures have survived more than say three, four, five centuries when there are huge inequalities among people in that culture. Is this a, a truism or are things going to change down the road if we start taking a longer view? So it, it is what specifically going to change in terms of our long-standing democracy? Or? Enough, enough people are hungry they're going to start climbing over the walls and getting my food. <laughs> so. I think that in the United States, even though we do see uh, rising economic inequality, that we're not anywhere near the levels that some countries have experienced that have led to uh, political upheavals. I think we're seeing a bit of that in this election, but not at the levels that we do uh, across the world. Um, so my hope is that we're not going to reach that. I think one of the earlier questions in terms of how much inequality can, can we tolerate my hope is that we're, we're not yet reaching that point where we need to be concerned about American democracy crumbling. Um, but on that note, I think that this is an election that has some serious implications for both the Democratic and the Republican Party. Um, that, they, that they need to basically wake up and figure out a way to connect with the concerns uh, and the issues pressing the American public and, and the complexity of those issues. And so I hope that both parties will take this election as a chance to regroup and rethink uh, their, their strategies moving forward in, in the coming elections. I think maybe you partially answered my next question, which was what needs to happen in our country? What do citizens need to do to avoid this? I've been hearing dire predictions since the 1980s from academics like yourself that we, if we can't solve the problem of economic inequity, and, and, and the growth of it, that we will have civil war. And I don't know what, what your prognostication might be for the next eight years, but can we survive and what do we have to do to get there? So I do think that this is a serious issue. That's why that this entire series is being devoted to this. And I, I really find it um, rewarding that people are, people are thinking about this and that this is on at least a portion of the, of the public's agenda in terms of, of seeing this as an issue of concern and an issue that has serious 
implications for American democracy. Um, again, I hope that we're not at that critical level um, where we need to be concerned about uh, the shattering of American democracy. I hope that this is a point in American history that where the parties and also the American public in terms of their involvement in communication uh, with those in government can uh, use this as a rallying point to, to move forward. Um, I think that we're, we're seeing this to an extent in terms of uh, members of the public. Uh, a lot of people felt very, when we go back to how people felt about this election, people were very divided um, and had very, very uh, uh, different emotional reactions to this election. Um, this is what I told my students following the election. Everyone was shocked by Hillary Clinton's uh, loss in the election, and, and some people were devastated. And my response was, we knew people were going to be devastated by this election, regardless of which of these candidates won. People felt very intensely about their choices in this election. And I think that this intensity is also leading people to become more politically active and communicating with their representatives. Um, sometimes, I think, unfortunately, not necessarily in the most civil manner. Um, so I think that's a point where we could do better in terms of uh, trying to communicate our diverse viewpoints in a way that's respectful of the other side. Uh, but I do think that it's absolutely a challenge in terms of what do we do moving forward and how can we deal, given that we know that there's, there's this deep-seated animosity between the parties, how, how do we bridge that? And how do we have meaningful conversations that are aimed towards having constructive governance in this country, um, given that we know that this is the political context that we're dealing with? I think that's absolutely a challenge for uh, this and future generations. And in a very civil way, we should thank our speaker for <laughs> Thank you very much. One, uh, one way of uh, answering that question about is inequality going to become so great that it's going to lead to revolution or whatever is to note that there's a lot of national variation. And if you had this much inequality in Denmark or the Scandinavian states, you'd already have a huge upheaval. So Americans, it's pretty clear, tolerate a lot more inequality than do other democracies. Not just the Scandinavians, but also, so yeah. I think a comparative perspective yeah. on this is, yeah. is uh, one way to answer that kind of question. Yeah, I agree. But I also think that not only the, the degree to which different countries tolerate this, but also when we look at where's the low in the U.S.? Yep. Like when we're, when yep. we're measuring that yep. gap, where's the low? It's higher. Well, but there's a cultural factor here yeah. with the American emphasis on individualism. Thank you. Other societies from Denmark to Japan have a much mm -hmm. more communal approach and they're much more concerned yeah. about the bottom 20%. Yeah. Whereas that, Americans no, say, well, point. they ought to work harder. And I think so that, there's a cultural yep, difference yep, here yep. That, that plays a very big yep. role. And I think that plays into people's perceptions of economic inequality. That they're, they're not very good at Absolutely. evaluating it because they're focused exactly. on the, the I. Yep. So th as usual, yep. you get all kinds of dimensions yep. and yep. Yep. different ways of wrestling with yep. this stuff. Yep. Yep. Really good presentation. Thanks. And I think, are you the one that I need to thank for inviting me? Or was it John? I don't remember. I want to thank you for coming. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you coming. You definitely played a role in the Well, I appreciate the vote of confidence because this is a little bit outside of, the, the specific topic is a little bit outside of my In terms of